Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sandy Alnock. I'm an artist and I work in a whole bunch of different mediums. If you're like me and you like all the mediums, I want to invite you to hit the subscribe button. I'm coming up to 150,000 subscribers, which is a little milestone for me. And I would love to have you join the channel. I am going to be painting in gouache today. Gouache is an opaque watercolor. And since it's still World Watercolor Month, gouache counts. So we'll talk a bit about the medium as we go. And I'm going to be painting an anglerfish today. I'm also going to show you a little preview of the class that is available, a brand new class for World Watercolor Month in gouache. And at the very end of the video, I'm going to show you the 60 paintings in the sketchbook that I created for my sister for her birthday. I started it last year, you've seen some of it, but now it's all done and I'm going to give you the flip through and how she responded to it. All right, let's get started, shall we? A while back, I shared a video showing all the colors that are now available in Daniel Smith gouache and was asked if I would do something with Indian Throne Blue. So G Lion 883, this is for you. Indian Throne's on the left, the Prussian Blue on the right, and Thalu Blue Turquoise in the middle, just three of the blues. I wanted to see if I could see the difference when they were just used by themselves on the paper. And, you know, what, what are they like in mass tone? If you're just looking for a dark blue, they all kind of work as a dark blue. So I started at the top with the Indian throne. Secondly, with the Prussian blue. Sorry about the focus on the camera. Got a little wacky. And then the third color, as I move down, I'm watering it out more. It's the Prussian, not Prussian, the Thalo blue turquoise. And you can lighten gouache by using it as watercolor by just adding more water to it, get it thinned out, or you can add white to it. It's gonna give you a different look both ways and you'll see a bit of that coming up. But I mostly just wanted to see if I could tell the difference in transitioning from one of these blues to the other and didn't see a whole lot. You'll notice that I'm a messy painter. I know that I'm gonna put layers on top of things so I don't worry about trying to get the most smooth blend across the page like some do. I also work around my main image because if I were to try to paint everything on this fish on top of the blue, it's just gonna get muddy real quickly. And I find if I can paint around that main shape, I'm a little bit better off. I do paint into the shape a little bit so that the fish is going to expand past the painted lines. But I do that so at least the center of the image ends up being, you know, painted on, on clean paper. Now here I'm just using the different dark blues to see if I see a difference as I go into the distance in the background. I did not see any when I'm using it in mass tone. Like all three blues work as a dark blue. So if that's your only concern, then they're all pretty equal, but they each turn into a slightly different type of light blue when you mix them with white. And that's what you can see in these lower little blobs. For the fish, I started out with a mid-tone blue and then started darkening the left and bottom side. And uh, I just wanted to push all that back because the light is gonna be coming from that lantern hanging off the fish's schnoz. And I wanted to have all the light in the front I also wanted to have kind of a glow from the inside. I have no idea if fish do this. I, this is a combination of a whole bunch of different undersea weird freaky fish that I was playing around with and made up my own fish. So there you go. Maybe this one really exists. It could be somewhere in the deep, deep ocean because that's where these guys live. And that's why there's no coral there because in the deep, deep ocean, you just may have rocks or sand at the bottom instead of all the fancy things that we often will put into an underwater scene. But creating the glow was challenging because when you're working with gouache, it lifts everything from under it. And I ended up like losing the white in the center, which I was kind of like, do I want white in the center? Do I not? Because I wanted a glow from inside his mouth, but not maybe quite white. So I just played around with, um, this is, a cadmium yellow, which I was not really happy with. It felt like a dirty yellow. And the pink is opera pink, which is a fugitive color, 
just so you know, it might be a happy pink, but it is going to disappear in the light in my sketchbook. It's probably not going to do much of anything um, just because the sketchbook stays closed. But if it's in a painting in the light, you will lose the pinkness of it. And then the orange, I think, is cad orange. So once I got at least the, the basis of the, the mouth done, I got a start in it. I'm going to have some teeth hanging in there. So again, I'm not worried about trying to make all the blends really perfectly smooth. This was a two and a half hour painting you're seeing here. So uh, it, it was one of those things that was just going to take me a long time. And I was not about to try to make everything perfect when I knew it was going to be covered by something else. So I just kind of throwing some of the pinks and oranges into the body almost to remind myself to go back and do that later. I will change it because these colors ended up too light. And the thing I've learned most about gouache that's actually playing into all my other art is paying much more attention to value. And I had before, I've always been somebody who loves contrast, but I find that gouache forces me to have to pay attention to value because you can use it straight out of the tube and you get a really dark color or you can mix it with white and you get a really pale color, but you have to be able to start mixing colors in between. And in gouache, you're generally not going to get really soft blends from one color into another. That's just not really going to happen a whole lot. Uh, another thing I've learned is that my camera does not film gouache very well. The background behind the fish does not look like that in real life. Like it looked very smooth. And when I looked at the footage, I was like, oh, that's gross. So just know that, uh, yeah, cameras do weird things when they see color and, you know, lots of different reasons why that is, but just know that it's not as bad as it looks. But my gouache does not tend to be super tidy anyway, because I am kind of just a throw the color on. The great thing about gouache is that you can just keep repainting over it. So if you mess up an area here, I'm just adding more light onto the front of the fish. Then you just keep adding more. If the fish, the back end of the fish is not dark enough because I wanted it to be very much far away from the light, you can paint more dark in over it. And I don't find that there's any rules about always going dark to light or light to dark because it really depends on what you're painting. You know, I started out with the background in this particular case just because I wanted to have something to play off of. I wanted to know how dark the background would be so that I could see how much I wanted to change my values on the fish. But you could also go the other direction, paint the fish the way you want it and then adjust the background color. But since I just wanted to use those blues and test them out on the paper and see how they worked, I didn't really worry about it too much. Now the fin ended up being kind of a greenish color because I painted the yellow over top of the blue. Remember when I said I left the inside of the fish white for a reason? I should have done that with the top of it if I wanted a brighter yellow. But I wasn't too worried about it just because it was going to be darkened anyway, as you'll see in a few minutes. Just playing around with adding, you know, the pinks and the oranges that I used in the mouth into the fin on the top. I wanted to give it some nice long points. There's all these like crazy shapes of anglerfish if you google them. There's just tons of them and they're all different shapes and different colors and they have some of them are super spiky. They have just spikes all over their entire body. This one is going to have a few points around it but he's going to have these nice long tendrils on the tops of each of the little points on the fin. And I'm letting them get darker in value as they get away from the light. So they go from that really light color into more of an orangey pink color and then into blue as it gets in the back. And the curled around tail is going to be in blues, but I made it too light. So all I had to do is rinse my brush, go pick up some darker pigment and paint in a darker color. So again, you get lots of opportunities to adjust things when you're working in gouache that you don't necessarily when you're working in other mediums. So I wanted to put some darks now back into the fin and kind of make a little bit more detail in there. And again, I wanted that really real strong punch of color. So I'm using almost mass tone blue and this is the Indian throne 
as well. But it's going to look a little different when it's on top of other colors than when it's just painted on the paper itself because it's mixing with the colors underneath of it. Every time you wet something, it lifts a little bit of what's under. So when you're going to put something really light, you need to be super careful to not be just, you know, smushing over it and swishing your color around. Just lay it down very thickly with your brush, get it a, a mixture that's going to move, but it, it needs to move in one stroke. If you go back and forth, you'll be lifting up all the color underneath all the time. So next I went through and started adding in more of like kind of some fish scale type textures. Didn't have any reference for this. So I was just kind of going from what I know about fish and knowing that that light is going to have an effect on just hitting the tippy tops of some of the, the lumpy scales because these anglerfish are some ugly, ugly mugs. <laughs> They're really quite something. Uh, if you remember in, I think it was Nemo. I can't remember the fish's name. Did he have a name? But anyway, there was, there was an anglerfish in that that had a little light hanging off of his nose and he was quite the mean little, little uh, fishy. And there are like, I don't even know how many. I've, I found like little charts of when you look up anglerfish where they have, you know, six, eight, ten different types of fish with completely different kinds of bodies. So I don't know if anglerfish just means they live way down deep at the bottom of the ocean. That's the deal. I have no idea. But they are some crazy wild fish. So maybe this one exists, even though I'm making it up from several photos that I kind of found a whole bunch of different things online. You know, I curled the tail my own way, kind of added some fins. I'm going to add some spikes and some teeth and all kinds of craziness. So, you know, when you're doing a painting, a piece of art, you can go exactly by a reference. And if you're not familiar with painting fish, a reference is going to really help you a lot. But I'm just kind of having fun with it because I've been painting fish for, I don't know, a long time. I, every summer I seem to get into underwater painting and fishes and octopuses and all that kind of thing. So you can check my Instagram. I'm going to probably be having a whole lot of gouache for the end of the month because I've been having so much fun with this. I want to play around with some more things. So you can check that. And I'm also, I've also been having almost every day during World Watercolor Month, I've had shorts here on YouTube. And you're uh, welcome to subscribe to the channel and you will discover those showing up if you like short videos. Now, the little light, I struggled with this because at first I was thinking, well, I want to have a yellow light with an orange glow around it. And then it has to somehow turn into blue. So I kept trying to play around with how do I, how do I work that? Do I put a lighter blue around it? Because that's what I saw in photo references where they had the little light hanging down, but it wasn't quite working. I, there was just something about it that color wise, I wasn't liking. So you'll see me come back and rework that later, but I wanted to let it dry before I went too crazy on it. And uh, then I started mixing a purple because I wanted to give him purple gums and teeth because if the glow is coming from inside the mouth, then the gums are going to be darker, like out in front of it, because they're going to be in front and hiding what's underneath. So I mixed a purple using the Prussian and the Opera and just kind of started playing around, giving some structure to that mouth, kind of pulling up almost like a, an overbite. Is it an overbite or an underbite when the bottom is in front? I'm just picturing him having like a big old overbite, underbite, whatever it is, big teeth hanging out in the front and then, you know, teeth coming down from the top and the bottom because these are mostly like vicious looking fish. They're they're not friendly. They, they just kind of have a thing going on. But the teeth are also going to be that same kind of color because they're backlit by what's coming out of the mouth. If you were going to have them only front lit by the little lamp thing, then you would have just the teeth shining white and maybe a little bit of color inside the mouth. But that was why I decided to make a glow in there so that I'd have something else bright in the painting since a lot of this was going to end up being very much on the dark side. I added some more brightness onto the gums of the fish because there's going to be a little light coming from the lamp thing that's hanging over his head. 
And this was when I stopped to go look up what is this thing called because I was putting this purple around it instead of going just for the yellow and orangey colors. And it's called an esca or an illicium. And it's an luminescent part of the fish's dorsal fin. So that big thing hanging off his head is called the dorsal fin. And it's modified into a filament with a sac of glowing bacteria at the tip. And the bacteria are called photobacterium, and they're symbiotic with the fish. So they provide protection and nutrients in exchange for a place to live. So now you know something that you didn't know about anglerfish, and so do I. In addition to liking the pinky purples, I also wanted to clean up what's going on with this whole light thing anyway, my little bacterium. And I'm starting to use simpler brush strokes. Now that I have a better idea of the color that I want, using simpler strokes is gonna help to make it cleaner. Now, if you walk up to a painting in a gallery really close, you're gonna see that they aren't trying to blend every color. And that's where I was trying to get away from is trying to blend every color. I wanted it to look like it was glowing, yes. But when you look at, you know, famous oil painting, Go look close and you'll see one stroke laid next to another stroke and they crisscross and they, you know, they have some texture to them, etc. But when you're working in gouache, you can do the same kind of thing and just put a stroke next to each other. And then when people step back from it, it looks like it's glowing and blended in some way, but it also has a very expressive feel to it. And that's what I'm learning a lot about doing in gouache is letting the brush strokes do what they do, not trying to make it into colored pencil or alcohol markers or a watercolor that's going to have some kind of blends to it. It's just going to be what it is, which is a thicker medium. And it's going to have more of that painterly look rather than a blended look. Now, there's some people that hate that. I totally hear you. That might not be the medium for you, but if you kind of like being able to paint over things, gouache is a lot of fun. And I do have a gouache jumpstart class if you just want to get started. And then the class I'm going to show you in just a minute is going to be an intermediate course. And I'm slowly adding to my bank of gouache courses over time. So as I get more students who are interested in more, I'll be adding more to the roster. So I've taken my tape off, just adding a bit of glow and color into the rocks on the bottom of the ocean that are right underneath of that light and letting all the other ones in the background, you can see they're just kind of disappearing because all the attention is drawn to those really bright ones that, you know, yellow, orange, and pink rocks and with their white highlights in the foreground and those big old nasty teeth. I want to shout out my Instagram followers who joined me for a live video last week in which the suggestion was made to paint an anglerfish because I was working on this jellyfish. So you can go see that on my Instagram if you would like. And then we have the anglerfish. So cute, so handsome. So let me tell you real quick about the new gouache class that just launched a few weeks ago here in July 2024. It's an intermediate class and it's a study in greens. So there's three different paintings and they're absolutely gorgeous. They're lots of fun to do. We'll do lots of layering and similar things that you've seen in this video. And now for the sketchbook. This is an epic adventure. A year ago, my sister came to visit me. And while she was here, she sent me a little file to brag on how many birds she had identified on her property at Harmony Hill, which is like the place that she lives. And she wanted me to paint all the birds into like one big painting. Now, my sister does not ask me for art. I give her art all the time, give all my family art, and they just kind of go, yeah, that's nice. This was the first time she'd asked for art. And I tried to figure out, could I get 60 birds in one painting? And could I get them sized so they were scaled right? Because you'll see there's some birds in here that are giant, like, you know, really big ones, huge wingspans, and then others that are just itty bitty. And I couldn't figure out how they'd all go into one painting. So I opted for a sketchbook. I also opted for gouache because I've been learning gouache and this was a great opportunity to make 60 little paintings. And I didn't count quite right. So I didn't have an individual page for all of them. So the inside front cover and back cover have four birds on each. So I could squeeze everything in there. But it was, you know, kind of a nice project to help me to learn how to paint things. I got really good at painting wood and some of the plants that 
that were in there. Some of them didn't come out well at all, and some of them came out great, but you know, it's my sister, and she was tickled pink. Her birthday was last week. She called me immediately, was so excited, and she said, oh, and you should make these. Birders would just love them. They would buy them up if you, you know, painted the birds that they have in their area. And she said, I don't know. She said, I don't know what you could charge for it, but like, I would pay like $50. And I kind of let her just talk. And she said, oh, maybe, maybe like $100. I would pay $100 for this. And I said, well, it's 60 paintings. And each one took me an hour and a half to two hours. And she said, oh, oh, um, well, maybe, maybe it's worth like $5,000 then. So <laughs> I think she doesn't understand. A lot of people don't understand the value of your time when you're making art. But she was tickled pink. And I told her this might be her Christmas present as well, because that's a lot of effort to put into one gift. We'll see. Last year we didn't end up exchanging Christmas gifts, so I might, uh, I might just say, yeah, go look through your book again, your little sketchbook. But I put Dorland's wax on each page, by the way, and I did that like a couple days before I was mailing it. Not the the best move because. The wax needs to cure a little bit, and I only had 24 hours to let it cure. Probably should have left it a little longer, because by the time I got done buffing it, because after 24 hours you can buff it and make it more satin, it still felt a little bit tacky. Not sticky, but just had a, a tackiness to the surface of the paper. And I've asked my sister to kind of leave it open, let it have air, and I want to see how long before it settles in. Like, does it suddenly become not tacky at some point and I want to go visit her at some point and check it myself and see how different it is from the day that I mailed it last week but I'm excited the project is done I don't want to do it again so even if you have five thousand dollars I will not paint you 60 birds <laughs> I just don't want to do that I do commissions but I just don't want to do that kind of commission the outside cover, by the time I finished manhandling it for all those paintings, was kind of a mess. It was a craft cover, so I painted the same painting that had been on the sketchbook color studies class because I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, links for classes are all in the doobly-doo down below if you're interested in learning more about gouache. Thanks so much for visiting with me today for this video. If you would do me the favor of hitting the like button. It means a lot to the YouTube algorithm and helps this video be seen by others. And you know what else helps? Leaving comments in the doobly-doo. And if you leave questions so I can answer something and we can have a conversation, I would love that. I'll talk to you again soon with another video. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. Bye.